So this is the second video, and I have another key, couple of keywords for you. This video is going to be on blast, one of our other readings for today, and you have two keywords. One is vorticist, and the other is just quite simply blast with an initial caps B. So blast begins for us on page 2009, right after we get TS uh, or Ezra Pounds in a station of the Metro. And Blast was originally published only twice, as you can read in the introduction, June 20th, 1914. So what's that in relation to in 1914 then? World War I, you say, ding, you got it right. So I wanted us to just take a look at Blast so we can see what all the politics are about that are out there and being published. I also wanted to show you Blast because it's a precursor to graphic novels and this idea of relying on typography and the visual in order to convey a narrative or an idea. If you take a look at the pages of Blast themselves, the typography jumps off the page and it also ends up being very um, revolutionary uh, and, and um, maybe not revolutionary but re rebellious in terms of the way that it's printed and it's angry and argumentative just in its print in the text itself. I wanted to show you one other thing and this actually doesn't come, um, this is a poster that the British were throwing up everywhere all over London during the blitzes of World War II because suddenly they would get planes flying overhead and bombing all of London and it was really awful and horrific. So they would send up these posters and it's hard to find them now. This is a replica. It says keep calm and carry on. Keep calm and carry on in case you didn't hear me. And that's a great way, that's a great catchphrase to have in the 21st century. And in fact, somebody's reproduced the exact typography because you can't find those posters anymore. But it's this idea that people just need to continue about on their daily lives and not really worry about getting blasted away. We talked about earlier in the 19th century that Sinn Fein started coming into London and really um, bringing all the fight into the home area, which the Londoners were not used to. So by the time we get to World War II, they're going to become very used to having to deal with bombs and rebuilding their city over and over again at home. Okay, so back to Blast. June 20th, 1914 is the first one that comes out. If you turn the page over on um, 2010, the history behind it, I just wanted to point this out to you. Sorry, it starts at the bottom of, of 2009. It says, the English writer and painter Wyndham Lewis founded and edited Blast, whose title he says, he said, quote, means the blowing away of dead ideas and worn out notions, uh, end quote. It also suggests fire explosion and damn, exclamation point. He drafted much, much of the Vortices Manifesto and fashioned its shocking visual design. Shocking visual design, people. Um, people are, don't use all caps and that typography in email because it signals yelling. So this, at this point, was shocking. Right? Um, likening Blast to a battering ram, Ezra Pound became a Vorticist after abandoning imagism because he felt that the vortex, the point of maximum energy, offered a more dynamic model for art than the static image of the imagists. So even though we just watched a video that talked to you about use of images in Ezra Pound's work, I want you to start thinking about how people are going to use images and artwork and visual representations of culture and society in order to signal rebellion, to move outside of class systems. We no longer have primogeniture, or coverture. Uh, we have women's suffrage coming up very soon. We, you know, we have a different House of Lords and a House of Commons, so politics have changed completely in the 20th century. Uh, in that next paragraph on page 2010, it says, um, the Vorticist Manifesto reflects the London modernist's competitive anxiety about European avant-garde's such as Cubism and especially Futurism. So can anybody name who a famous Cubist artist would have been. This is where I miss seeing you guys in person because you would have been yelling at me now. Under the charismatic leadership of F.T. Marinetti, the futurists celebrated speed, modernization, and the machine while calling for the destruction of the museums, the libraries, all such bastions of the past. Can you imagine if we destroyed everything of the past? 
This is going to recur when we come up to postmodernism. We start talking about nostalgia. And you see that we also had this past coming up with the Victorians when they start to, referring back to Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. So the futurists are really sick of that. They don't want to see that anymore. Okay. So back to 2010. Um, the, for, the vortices, and this is one of our keywords for today, in lists of things and people to blast and bless compiled at group meetings, similarly blast convention, standardization, the middle class, even the years 1837 to 1900. Why those years in particular, people? What is signaling 1837 and the change that happened? You should know this by now. So then we go down on 2010 to actually look at BLAST. Long live the vortex! Exclamation point. Now this is 1914, start of World War I. We don't really have to have people coming together the way that we're going to, or nations coming together the way we're going to in World War II. But at the same instant, England as a little island is not that far separated from Europe and what's going to happen over there. The first line of Vortex starts, very revolutionary and rebellious. Long live the great art Vortex sprung up in the center of this town. And the town is um, in reference to London. We stand for the reality of the present, not for the sentimental future or the sacrament past. And it says the boastful of, or a valor uh, of the past. So the vortices are really talking about what's in the center, what's happening in the moment, right exactly now, rather than looking forward or looking back. And we're coming out of the 19th century and the 18th century where they couldn't help but do this because everybody was so overwhelmed with the industrial revolution, with literacy and the rise of print material and print culture and then we hit Victoria's reign which all hell breaks loose with colonialism and um, going over and trying to win, win wars like the Boer War we have the Zulu Wars where I think I mentioned before that the British got resoundingly crushed in that endeavor we want to leave nature and men alone we're letting go of the romanticists we do not want to make people wear futurist patches or fuss men to take to pink and sky blue trousers. We are not their wives or tailors. The only way humanity can help artists is to remain independent and work unconsciously. And this leads us a bit into what T.S. Eliot actually wanted to say to us. And I'll get to him in just a second. Just know, bookmark, T.S. Eliot, vortices, humanity, artists. Remember that. We need the unconsciousness of humanity, their stupidity, animalism, and dreams. We believe in no perfectibility except our own. Ooh, that's a little godless. Intrinsic beauty is in the interpreter and seer, not in the object or content. We do not want to change the appearance of the world because we're not naturalists, impressionists, or futurists, the latest form of impressionism. And do not depend on the appearance of the world for our art. No verisimilitude for them. It's all coming from the imagination. We only want the world to live and to feel its crude energy flowing through us. It may be said that great artists in England are always revolutionary, just as in France any really great artist had a strong traditional vein. Blast sets out to be an avenue for all those vivid and violent ideas that could reach the public in no other way. Art is a form of rebellion. It no longer re represents the creative imagination, the singular poet hero, the creative genius. It represents a wider collective. This is bending towards socialism and fascism. That's where we start to see it get revolutionary. Blast will be popular, essentially. It will not appeal to any particular class, but to the fundamental and popular instincts in every class and description of people to the individual. The moment a man feels or realizes himself as an artist, he ceases to belong to any milieu or time. So we're completely disavowing that the artist holds anything special in his or her mind. There's no translator. There's no great connection to nature. There's no holding that particular artist or literature as a hero the way we did with Wordsworth and anybody else that we get through the Victorian and the Romantic period. So Blast 
asks us as modernists to let it go, to create with whatever is around us, to look at everybody as an artist. I think artists might have a problem with that, but we have Ezra Pound and then later T.S. Eliot also talking about this kind of idea of tradition and the individual talent. If you turn over the page on 2012, we see at the bottom, well, when the typography gets very big, and when I say typography, what I'm referring to is those huge words on the page you can see everywhere. It says, the poor are detestable animals. They are only picturesque and amusing for the sentimentalist or the romantic. The rich are bores without a single exception. We want those simple and great people found everywhere. Blast presents an art of individuals, capital I. Blast years 1830 to 1900, meaning get rid of them. Curse abysmal, inexcusable middle class, also aristocracy and proletariat. Hmm. So we know Marx has come in because we've started talking about the proletariat. Blast pasty shadow cast by a gigantic poem. Imagine at introduction of bourgeois Victorian vistas. So here we have a direct contradiction to what the Victorians are wanting us to do. Wring the neck of all sick inventions born in that progressive white wake. Blast their weak, weeping whiskers. Here suit rhetoric of eunuch and stylist, sentimental hygienics, Rousseauians, so Rousseau. Okay, so Rousseau was one of the ones that talked about, contemplated this idea of life for the romantics. Um, he was very important, so we have backlash against the romanticism here. Wild nature cranks, fraternizing with monkeys, diabolic raptures and roses of the erotic bookshelves culminating in purgatory of Putney. Chaos of Enoch Gardens, laughing jennies, ladies with pains, good-for-nothing Guinevere. Does this sound familiar? Defense of Guinevere. Gypsy kings and espadas bowing the knee to wild mother nature, her feminine contours, unimaginative insult to man. Damn. This is the list of things to damn. All those today who have taken on that rotten menagerie and still crack their whips and tumble in Piccadilly Circus as though London were a provincial town. So the background here for Piccadilly Circus is that it was the area traditionally used where people could come and sell their wares. Uh, Piccadilly Circus is still existent in London, but it's uh, shops and it's the Gap and other much more universal shops that you could actually get in you know downtown San Jose or at the mall. We turn the page on 2014 and the typography starts to jump out us and almost attack us as the readers. London is not a provincial town. It's not. So when we say something is provincial, we're saying that it's very local, that it's very closed off. And Blast is an attempt to talk about the universality of London. Not that it's better than anything else, but that it's very cosmopolitan and it represents the world. We will allow wonder zoos, but we do not want the gloomy Victorian circus in Piccadilly Circus. It is Piccadilly's circus, not meant for menageries trundling out of 60s, Dickensian clowns, Corelli lady riders, troops of performing gypsies who complain besides that one six a night does not pay fare back to Clapham. <laughs> That's a geographic joke there. Blast the post office, Frank Bangwood, um, Robertson Nicole, Reverend Pennyfeather, Bells, Galloway Kyle, Cluster of Grapes, Bishop of London, and all his posterity. And then it goes on and on. And also in your, your footnote, it identifies who these particular people are. And nobody is exempt here. It exempts the British Academy, which is the well-known art um, academy created in England to sort of nationalize artistry, nationalize what it was to own and be an artist. And so with that, I leave you with Blast as we turn next to T.S. Eliot's um, Love Song with J. Alfred Prufrock and also a little bit of a lecture on his essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent. And the next one, I'll also have a, a re repeat those keywords and get them back to you.